Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me today. I have Lieutenant Governor Larry Roden with me that will share a few words and then also here and available for questions is Secretary of the Department of Health Kim Malsum Risden. A quick update on the testing that went on in Sioux Falls yesterday in regards to the Smithfield plant and the employees and their families and dependents. Uh, it resulted in just shy of 1,500 tests being run. We averaged three people per car, although some of the vehicles had six to eight individuals in them uh, that requested to be tested. It took about two minutes per individual to run a test. And according to the Avira team, that estimate is that approximately 10% of those individuals that were tested did have symptoms. Uh, I want to thank Avera for all their hard work uh, down there at this site and also the Department of Health individuals that were there. Um, the National Guard and the CDC were all present uh, and said it was a very successful day with a lot of tests being taken and samples and run and we expect to have those results back within 48 hours of those samples being taken. The CDC team on the ground noted that this was the largest testing event that they had ever been a part of. Uh, and they felt it went very well and was well coordinated. I also want to thank all of the language specialists that helped yesterday. Um, they were amazing and their help was invaluable. Uh, and again, um, we will continue to do this for several more days and make sure that testing is continuing and that those results are reported and they will be available on the COVID website, covid.sd.gov. And we'll stay on top of that and let you know how things are going. Uh, I do uh, want to announce today that I have accepted the resignation of the Secretary of Agriculture, Kim Vanneman, uh, who's been a longtime friend of mine. Uh, she and I have worked on ag policy in South Dakota for almost 20 years. Uh, she's a very special friend of mine. I don't know of a bigger advocate for agriculture. Uh, she has served not just at her local level, but at the state level and at the national level, making sure that farmers and ranchers were supported um, and that small businesses were supported and that we had the ability to pass our operations on to the next generation. Uh, that is really where her heart is, is to make sure that the next generation has the opportunity to be on the land and continue to provide for this nation's uh, food supply. While her title is going to change, uh, she is going to continue to be a valuable advisor to me and an advocate for South Dakota agriculture, and I just can't thank her enough for her willingness to come into our administration and to lead the Department of Agriculture. Uh, she will be missed. Uh, we will, and I also have announced today that the Lieutenant Governor will be filling in as Interim Secretary. And so with that announcement, I'd like to give him uh, the opportunity to share a few words of the work that he's been doing uh, in the interim to coordinate some of the help that's necessary for our livestock producers. As all of you know, he's been working with our pork producers, our beef producers, helping give them some opportunities for more market access and to give them the opportunity to get through this situation we see with the virus spreading across the state and make sure they have processing opportunities to move their livestock. So with that, I'll turn it over to the Lieutenant Governor. Well, thank you. And, and uh, first, I'd like to start by saying thank you to Kim Vanneman for her service in the years and fighting for South Dakota and for agriculture in South Dakota. Uh, I mentioned to the governor earlier that the first time I met Kim Vanneman and the governor uh, was at a meeting with President Bush a number of years ago advocating for agriculture. So it's, uh, uh, I've been, I very much appreciated her friendship and uh, her background and the things that she's brought to agriculture for our state. I also want to thank Governor Nome for the opportunity. Uh, for me, being raised on a farm and ranch, born and raised in western South Dakota and working in agriculture my entire life, uh, serving on the Ag Committee and chairing Ag Committee in the legislature for a couple of years, uh, what an opportunity to get to represent South Dakota's number one uh, industry. As the governor mentioned, my immediate focus will be helping our state's ag industry turn the corner uh, following this pandemic, uh, working to help our meat producers uh, who've become all too familiar with the supply chain bottlenecks even prior to this pandemic. And now, uh, as, as the governor mentioned the last several weeks, uh, I've worked with uh, Rick Valerie and uh, with Dr. Otakoven at some of the immediate problems, starting with uh, 
with the Smithfield closure, the problems that that brought about for our, our perk producers. Uh, initially, we worked with the, governors, with, uh, with the governor to issue an executive order to allow them some slack in their numbers and their confinement units. More recently, working with Dr. Odekoven and uh, local uh, processing houses to find avenues so we can take some of the pressure off of the pork producers who have a backlog of hogs and overweight hogs. Also, uh, in the press uh, lately, we've seen a lot of uh, information, especially out west and especially in the world of beef, about uh, Wyoming law that's being considered to help uh, producers in direct sales to beef. Uh, I was immediately interested in that, and as I looked into that, I've, I've become more educated about our current system in South Dakota. And the fact of the matter is, our system in South Dakota al already allows more latitude for our producers uh, than what Wyoming law would even with this in place. Having said that, the one area that it doesn't allow for is sale of South Dakota inspected beef across state lines. And I think that's an issue that we can work on, we can resolve. We're already working together with uh, Dr. Odokoven and our, uh, the, uh, the Department of Ag in finding a solution, whether it's uh, federal legislation or a presidential executive order to allow for our state inspected project product to be sold across state lines. I, and I think that has a uh, long-term impact if we can find ways to add value for our producers, uh, especially in the pandemic to get us over the hump, but also long into the future. So with that, again, I would like to thank the governor for giving me this opportunity. Uh, what an honor for me to uh, work for agriculture in the state of South Dakota. Thank you all. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate that. Um, and before I close today, I do want to draw attention to an issue that's extremely important to me uh, and to all of our nine tribes here in the state of South Dakota. May 5th is the National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Native Women. According to a 2016 Department of Justice report, more than four in five indigenous women in the United States experience violence in their lifetimes. Many of our tribes have helped and made great contributions to bringing awareness to this issue, including federal legislation like Savannah's Law. In my first year in office, I signed legislation into place that put in, in place procedures uh, that would allow South Dakota, when investigating cases of missing and murdered indigenous women, uh, that we would have more information and data available to us. Last summer, I invited tribal elders, or actually in tribal elders invited me to ride with them on a memorial ride honoring missing and murdered indigenous women across the state. Uh, it was impactful for me in a, in a special day where we talked about the incredible challenges that so many of these families in South Dakota and across the country and the world face. I rode with tribal elders, native women and children, many other tribal uh, members that represented South Dakota's tribal nations. Earlier this year, on behalf of the state, I accepted a missing and murdered native women a quilt that was crafted by tribal elder women. Um, I display this uh, quilt in a plaque here in the state capitol and at the mansion for all of those uh, here in the state to enjoy, but also to look on and reflect about the plight that has impacted so many women. I want to educate communities about the important issue and draw awareness to the fact that we all need to take care of each other and make sure that we stop what is happening with so many of our folks that are in our tribal nations. Please take a minute today uh, throughout your day and think about these unique challenges. See what you can do to draw awareness to this situation that we're facing and remember these women in their families and lift them up in prayer. With that, let's open it up to any questions that you may have. Governor JP at KORN News Radio. Sure, go ahead, JP. Well, you had 1,500 uh, tests in Sioux Falls yesterday. Are you considering doing uh, similar mass tests in other communities like Aberdeen, Yankton, Mitchell, Watertown, and Brookings? And what would uh, trigger a mass testing event like that? We certainly would consider that if the situations uh, indicated that that would be necessary. I can invite uh, our Secretary of Health to come up and to talk about some of the protocols that uh, deemed this a situation that we could facilitate this in Sioux Falls. 
Thank you, Governor. This is Kim Malsum Rised. And so um, in terms of the current event that's going on in Sioux Falls, that was really important to getting hundreds of people back to work um, after the closure of the uh, Smithfield plant there. And so um, that will be a, a major consideration moving forward is if we're having uh, major impacts on people being able to work and to, to, to do that safely. So um, I think as we talked about yesterday, we're certainly open. Mass testing is a part of our plan, um, and we would be looking to use it in several different instances. Um, nursing homes will be another key industry where we um, would expect to see some mass testing. We've seen that happen already um, uh, without the state's involvement, um, but certainly we would look uh, to help partner on those events in the future as well. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Further questions? Yes, Beth Warden calling with Dakota News Now. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, I was wondering if you had any further plans to meet with the group of Smithfield workers and those organizations supporting them. The letter that they sent, I believe, last week requesting a meeting with you. Yes, we believe that we will be facilitating that. I, I don't believe it will be able to be a in-person meeting uh, just because of the situation we're in with COVID-19 and the spread across the state. But we are facilitating making sure that we can have a conversation about some of their concerns. Question Governor, in the room? This is Stephen Groves from AC. Stephen, I'm going to take a question in the room first and then I'll go to you. Go ahead, Patrick. Uh, Patrick Callahan, South Dakota Broadcasters. Would you consider or are you considering Lieutenant Governor as an appointment for the full-time Secretary of Ag? You know, right now, um, we just accepted Kim's letter and uh, wanted to make sure that we had someone with an ag background heading up the department. And I'm very grateful that Larry has agreed to do that in the interim. So um, no further plans beyond that. Stephen, go ahead. Uh, with the packing plants being, being designated as critical infrastructure, I was wondering if you would consider um, stationing the National Guard to man some of those plants if uh, the workforce was either unable or uh, not willing to, um, to man the plants? You mean as far as be workers in the facility? Uh, yeah, so I assigned them to a mission to help keep the plants up and running. No, that has not been something that I've considered, nor do I believe that's an appropriate use of our National Guard. Um, and I would have to look to the Defense Production Act and the executive order by the president to see if that impacts that definition of their role in these types of situations. But um, I'm not aware of any other place in South Dakota or point in time where they've been utilized in that manner. Yes. Governor Seth Tupper, SDPB. Okay, we'll go to Seth, and then I've got a question in the room, too. Uh, it looks like the uh, all or nearly all of the money in the Small Business Relief Fund has been uh, loaned out, and I was just wondering if you're thinking about trying to put any more money into that fund or if you're satisfied at this point with uh, where, where that's at. Yes, the, the money that we put into the Small Business Crisis Relief Fund uh, that was set up by the legislature on veto day uh, has been allocated out to small businesses all across the state of South Dakota. Uh, we've looked at possibly putting more resources in that fund. It would have to be dollars outside of the state of South Dakota if there were federal resources that we could utilize for economic situations like this. And that's one of the things that we're considering, but also relying on guidance from Treasury and Congress on if that is a possibility. I think in light of what we're seeing with revenue numbers coming in, uh, knowing that we're going to see some pretty significant impacts coming in reports that will come forward in June and July, uh, we're not sure that we have state dollars that we could put into that fund at this time. Uh, good morning, yes. ma'am. Joseph Go Barkoff, Capital Journal. Um, have you seen the uh, about uh, missing, murdered indigenous women? Mm -hmm. um, have you seen the movie uh, Somebody's Daughter? And have you uh, spoken to uh, the Attorney General? Um, I, the they had a screening for it here at, at the the Rapid City Transit, and mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, not uh, the bus, and he was there. Mm -hmm. and we all got you know. Have you seen it or or talked to him about it or? Yes, I was aware when they had the screening of somebody's daughter, although I couldn't make it when it was being conducted, but I heard it's an extremely impactful movie and uh, 
you've just reminded me that I need to find time to watch it because um, the Attorney General and I have talked extensively about uh, missing, murdered, and indigenous women uh, and what we can do in South Dakota to make sure that we've got all hands on deck to bring awareness to the situation that so many of our tribes face, but also what we can do to make sure we have the tools and statute that we need to make sure we protect these women. Um, this is Morgan at the Rapid City. Sure, go ahead, Morgan. I just want to go back to Beth's question and just kind of, I mean, have you had a chance to read or respond to the letter yet, too, in addition to maybe any plan you have or any concrete steps you have to meet with the group? I know my staff is uh, facilitating it. Okay, well, have you had a chance to respond? Uh, that's exactly what I've already covered is that we are setting up that conversation. It's being facilitated and we'll let you know how that conversation goes. Thank you, Morgan. Governor Noam, it's Claudia Contreras with New Center One. Sure, go ahead, Claudia. So um, I just have a question about local business. Obviously there's kind of like a lot of information being pumped out by the DOA, DOH and obviously um, news outlets. What are we doing in order to prevent um, consumers from being, you know, a little bit afraid to go out and visit those businesses. Obviously, when they don't have customers, business goes down and things get worse for them. So can you talk about that? Well, one of the things that we facilitated is um, to push back on a lot of the fears that people have felt is to give them information and facts. Uh, we've consistently put on covid.sd.gov uh, information on what individuals can do and actions to protect themselves. Um, how they can make sure that they're only going out for essential trips. Uh, there's also connections on that website of volunteers who'd be willing to run some of those errands for them or help them facilitate uh, essential needs that they might have. We also have guidance for businesses there, so I think that it's good for individuals to be informed on what guidance um, businesses may be following to know how they are being protected by those individuals that run our small businesses across the state. I know the Department of Health still has their call line and call center open. So if people do have concerns, they can certainly reach out and speak to an individual that will give them specific uh, uh, answers. And if they have specific concerns about an area of the state, I know that they will help facilitate that conversation as well. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, we having that resource available on that website, that 800 number, we believe that many people that do have individual concerns are able to do that. And if they are concerned about their health in particular, uh, many of these individuals are reaching out to their providers and their doctors as well. And we've drawn attention and put available on our website um, other nonprofits, information, uh, even crisis counseling lines, uh, mental health lines that are all available for them should they need resources going forward. Thank you. Thank you, this is Trevor Mitchell with the Argus Leader. Sure, go ahead, Trevor. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if either you or uh, potentially the Secretary of Health could talk a little bit about uh, maybe an update on the uh, clinical trial of uh, hydroxychloroquine. Mm -hmm. Trevor, this is Kim Olson Risden. So the registry part of the trial is ongoing, and that means COVID pos positive patients um, in concert with their providers, their doctors are able to access the drug if they feel like that's the right course for them. Um, so that is up and running. Um, and I know that um, particularly uh, being used uh, within the Sanford system um, and across their uh, across multiple states actually um, within their system. The clinical side, the clinical trial side um, is something that we're still working through. Um, some of the details, um, I think people are aware that the FDA came out with some information around um, some safety um, information uh, associated with hyd hydroxychloroquine and so we're looking at that and um, we'll be actually meeting on Thursday to talk about next steps for that part of the trial. Okay, hey, thank you. Further questions? So this is that that can ask, again. Could I ask uh, Governor Roden a question? Sure. <laughs> Le or Lieutenant Governor Roden. <laughs> Sorry. Second Lieutenant okay. Governor Roden. Gave him a good promotion there. Yeah. Uh, Man, I'm really <laughs> moving up the chain. <laughs> yeah, rapidly. 
Um, I was just curious if you, could, if you could tell us a little bit about why, what is it that keeps producers from selling their beef directly across state lines now, and how exactly would that work? Would the producer, for example, have the beef slaughtered locally and then ship the cuts you know, across state lines? Uh, if you could tell us a little more about that. Yeah, great question. Well, currently, uh, you know, there are three tiers of of uh, slaughter plants in South Dakota, the the inspection exempt, which are the small, the the Bartling Processing and Union Centers inspection exempt, or custom exempt, ex actually. And so he, I can, I've sold beef through him uh, in the past uh, a quarter at a time. Uh, the next level is state inspected, and that's what we're talking about. Is state inspected plants can. If you have the uh, a beef taken to a uh, state inspected plant, it can go any place in the state. Uh, can't cross out out of the state line because of federal laws and federal regulations. And there's been an attempt by by Senator Rounds, I believe, had a bill a year ago to allow because the the inspection is as good as a federal inspection, but. Uh, Obviously, it's gotten some pushback at the federal level from the packers, imagine that, that don't want uh, state inspected beef to be sold uh, out of state. Uh, so I think we have an opportunity now, first of all, we have a, a product that's uh, probably superior to any other product in the nation, and I might be a little biased on that. Uh, but we have an opportunity now with this pandemic either through legislation or executive order, pre presidential executive order, to get past that and allow for us to, uh, our producers to sell across state lines. And so we're working pretty closely with our congressional delegations and uh, our connections in D.C. to help facilitate some of that change and allow for some uh, e initially short-term fix to the problem. Hopefully that would demonstrate uh, the quality of the South Dakota product and and work toward a long-term solution for producers to add value. Could I get a follow-up on that, Lieutenant Governor? May is beef month. This is an easy question. May is beef month. What would you like to say to cattle producers right now? They're having a hard time. I talked to a lot of them. What encouragement would you offer during beef month, and why is South Dakota so highly regarded? Well, I think, you know, the quality of our product is second to none. And uh, we, we put our beef up against anybody. Right now, uh, there's not a lot to be happy about as far as the, from the production standpoint. But we're faced with some very depressed markets. At the same time, uh, record, record high box beef prices. Uh, and so that will be uh, one of my top priorities as Secretary of Ag is to work towards solutions in that area because that just isn't right, that our producers are living hand to mouth and, and going broke at the time when we're seeing record high retail beef prices all across this country. One of the things I would point out when it comes to those inspection certifications is that the South Dakota certified inspection is just as rigorous, if not even more so, than the federal inspection. So in us allowing our producers to market their products across state lines, we feel like the consumer confidence should be just as high with a state inspection as it would be a federal inspection because of the rigorous standards that we have here in South Dakota. Further questions? Governor? Um, yes. We've seen a number of deaths today uh, from nursing homes. I was wondering if you have any uh, specific approach or strategy to uh, tackling that issue with the coronavirus. Specific to impacts on nursing homes? Is that the question? Yes. Yes. I'm going to let Kim speak to that because I do know that we have some specific things that we are doing for that vulnerable population. This is Kim Olson Risen. So yeah, our work with nursing homes is uh, remains very, very critical as we move forward. Obviously, um, individuals that live in nursing homes are a very vulnerable population, and um, can be uh, much more adversely impacted by uh, you know co the COVID diagnosis. Um, part of our response includes um, ongoing um, guidance and communication around things like infection control, making sure that nursing homes have PPE. 
um, we allocated some of the funding that we got at the fe at, from the federal uh, government down to the state level, um, specifically to nursing homes to help them with their supply needs. Um, we also help them through um, the state resources that we have so that their workforce can be protected and um, that can help keep individuals safe. Um, when we do find um, situations um, of COVID in, in nursing homes or other congregate care settings, we look to see that aggressive testing happens so that we can understand what's going on with the population and then isolate those people, um, uh, which is called cohorting. And so um, that means, um, you know, sometimes people need to move their rooms so that they're, if they're negative, they're going to be housed with other folks that are negative and, and vice versa. And so that's a strategy that can help contain um, COVID in a, in a facility like a nursing home. Um, the key though is, is just that ongoing communication, um, infection control. We're actually right now in the process of conducting um, uh, unannounced infection control uh, reviews at every nursing home in our state. And that is a way to help um, provide um, technical assistance, to provide guidance, make sure that folks have the right information and that they're able to implement um, good processes. And um, I just got an update on this from my team this morning. And so far, those reviews have gone very, very well. Um, the problem is COVID is very um, highly transmittable. And so when we see it in a setting like a nursing home, it's, um, it's just very, very easily spread. Um, but we're doing everything we can in partnership with those providers to minimize that. Mm -hmm. The secretary, sure. can you explain a little bit of the logic behind, uh, so there's tons of difficulties with wearing a mask and, mm -hmm. and not even the N95 mask, just you know whether you store-bought, you know, surgical, all the way down to, you know, people fidget, touch, they don't realize that they're supposed to, you know, if you touch, you've got to go wipe, you know, mm -hmm. wash bef before you, you, that is a problem. But the, the whole, I think, theory behind masking up now is, is the, it protects you, not me. Can, can you sure. speak to that? So the, um, sure, so the, the issue of masking, um, the guidance on that has changed um, as we've um, kind of gone through this process. And so there was a time when the CDC did not um, recommend routine masking except for um, very high risk individuals um, or healthcare workers. Um, the guidance now is for individuals going out in public to consider masking. And the real reason for that change is because um, if a person um, wears a mask out in public, they're protecting them um, protecting from spreading um, coronavirus even when they don't know that they might have it. And that's kind of coming along with the fact that we understand COVID um, can be present in individuals without any symptoms whatsoever. And so um, the masking is intended to help people not uh, spread coronavirus. Further questions? Okay. Thanks, everybody.